The real moment where we realized, I guess, the power of it was, was the first event that we ever did. Just from a numbers perspective, prior to the event, we were doing revenues of two or three hundred pounds a day. And after the event, we did 30,000 pounds in revenue in the first half an hour that the website was turned back on. Francis is coming straight out of Soli Hall. He's the owner, founder, CEO, and the driving force behind the UK fitness apparel juggernaut that is Gymshark. Having started his business from his bedroom in what uh, Ross Edgley told me uh, was just an idea, a sewing machine, and a refusal to quit, uh, last year Gymshark was officially given unicorn status, uh, which basically means Nike and Adidas, you are officially on notice. Um, <laughs> Stephen Bartlett is the founder and former CEO of Social Chain. He's also, in no particular order, Stephen, the host of a hugely successful podcast, a best-selling author, a serial entrepreneur, a Vodafone business ambassador, and also the youngest investor to appear on the panel in The Dragon's Den. Uh, and most recently, he was named in the top 10 of the Power List's most influential black Britons for 2022. So they both like to keep themselves quite busy. Uh, a dragon and a unicorn on the same stage. <laughs> nice one. Um, not bad for a couple of university dropouts. Um, to kick us off, before we get to social, could you just give the guys in the audience a little breakdown, I guess, of how you got to the early stages of the entrepreneurial dream that you're living? Okay. So my, my first experience of business, right, was I... So as a young kid, I have basically did work experience in my granddad's business. I think I was about 13, 14 years old. Um, and what we would do is we'd drive around the Midlands and we'd basically fill furnaces with either brick or ceramic fibre. So he basically, that's what he would do, right? He would build furnaces. Um, and then as we would do that, he would tell me stories about how he started this business. And he was, he was a one-man band and he, was, he absolutely loves what he does and he still does it to this day, even though he probably shouldn't. Um, and I'll never forget, he told me a story about how He'd basically remortgaged the house and spent everything that he had on one particular job, building this huge furnace that was going to be shipped off to Germany. And there was so much time where he thought this whole thing would fall through and it would just fall apart. And he would go home and he would look at my mom, my nan, her sister who had learning dis uh, difficulties, so basically he had to pay for her care as well. And all these times when he would think that he was going to lose everything and they'd be out on the streets. So... I learned there hard work and the ability to take risks because then I knew that any risk that I'll be taking in business after that are nothing compared to the risk that he took. Um, after that, started making websites, apps, all sorts of different things, and I just basically didn't have too much of a fear, fear of failure because of those stories that he told me. Um, and after six or seven failures, um, built Gymshark, and that's the business where I work today. The rest is history. Mm. Stephen. <laughs> Um, so I think, I think the thing that kind of made me an entrepreneur and sculpt me the most was my early upbringing. You know, I look at my family and I think I'm the youngest of four siblings. So what, was, what dynamic was, was in play that made me the entrepreneur and made my brothers and sisters all go off to university? And really it was when, when I was about five, six, my family got into real financial hardship to the point of like bankruptcy. Um, and then my mum, I think what tends to happen, especially with the youngest sometimes, is they, the parents kind of presume they've raised all the kids. So they, they, they kind of, uh, they weren't in the house when I woke up and they weren't in the house when I went to right. sleep. And what that did was, and also exacerbated by that was the fact that I was pretty much the only black kid in an all white school in Plymouth, in Devon. So I'm trying to fit in as it is, right? I'm straightening my hair to, so that I, my hair looks um, like the, my white friends did. And I'm trying to figure out how to get the shoes when I've got no one to give me the money to get the cool shoes that everyone else in the playground has. I'm really trying to fit in. Our house was smashed to pieces. I mean, six foot high grass, grass out front, smashed windows on the front for 15 years, fridges, TVs in the back garden in a perfect middle class neighborhood. <laughs> okay. Right? And Chris Rock has this quote where he says, um, we grew up... Um, rich enough to grow up completely broke in, a, in an all-white neighborhood. And when I read that, like, I still remember where I were because it, it sounded like my life. And so what that did is two things. It created this, this, this sort of piece of information in my mind that if I am to have anything, it's a direct consequence of, of behavior that I do. There's nothing left under the Christmas tree at Christmas. There's nothing on your birthdays. There's, nothing, there's no pocket money left for school dinners. Everything comes from something you do because my parents aren't in the house anymore. And the other thing was just tremendous insecurity 
to have those things to fit in. And so off I went, 18 years old, um, ended up you know, doing the school trips for our school, did the deals for our vending machines, and so the school wouldn't have to pay for them anymore, and they got a commission on them. I took my cut. 15, 16 years old, I realized that these peers that I have are going to be the people I'm competing with as adults, so I'll be just fine. Stop going to school, get expelled, do my exams at home, go off to university, go to one lecture, wait a minute, this is school again, drop out after one lecture, start a business, which is a student notice board. In trying to get millions of people to come to that website without money, discovered social media, realized I could get millions of people to come if I just owned every social media page. So I went around 2012, 2013, meeting every young kid I could that had built a social media page, hired all of them. That's where the word social chain comes from. It was a chain of social media pages. And we were doing 7 billion video views in our, at our peak a month. Um, that became a marketing business, which became an e-commerce company. And now it's listed in a German stock exchange, and it's this big Goliath of a company. And I've, I resigned last year. That makes it sound easy, doesn't it? I mean, uh, I don't know why we're not all doing it. Um, you both obviously recognise the potential for social early on. Let, let's start with you, Ben. What was it that made you think? Because obviously it's easy looking back now and everyone goes, oh yeah, well, social media and influencers and all that kind of thing. But you were an early adopter. What made you think yeah. it was going to work? Um, Jim Shark. Yeah, so, so it wasn't like a strategic thing, right? We didn't like sit in a room and go, social media is going to be big. It's just where we were. Like, we didn't really watch telly. And I wanted, to, well, as a young kid, I wanted, wanted to play for the villa. Found out very quickly I was nowhere near good enough. Then my goals became I wanted to be a bodybuilder and step on stage. And the way that I learned how to do that and how to lift in the gym was on YouTube. So naturally, because we spent time there, we then, you know, basically ended up sending out our product to people that were also on YouTube. And all my heroes were on YouTube as I sort of got into my teenage years. Um, the real moment where we realized, I guess, the power of it was, was the first event that we ever did. Um, I mean, the stars massively aligned for us, right? One of the biggest and best events in Europe um, for fitness and bodybuilding was based in Birmingham back in the day. And we would go there every single year as like a pilgrimage. And there was one year when we really wanted to be there. Completely emptied the bank and went there and over the next 12 months saved for the actual event. When the event came round, we bought our heroes, these social media stars who had ended up becoming our mates. Um, and the event just blew up for us. It was wildly successful. And just from a numbers perspective, prior to the event, we were doing revenues of two or three hundred pounds a day. And after the event, we did 30,000 pounds in revenue in the first half an hour that the website was turned back on. So it was huge, right? We sold out of everything. And by the way, half the stuff was handmade then. So I was crapping myself, thinking I'm going to have to get on that sewing <laughs> machine very fucking fast. So, and then we just, and we just went and we rolled and we rolled and we rolled. And the thing that we did well there, as well as like leaning into social, was we then had a bunch of money in the bank and we spent every penny of it and we did the Birmingham event again and, the, and then we did an event in Germany. That went well. We spent every single penny and we did Germany. We did the UK, we did California, we did Ohio, we did Melbourne. And fast forward now, nine years on, surprise, surprise, where are the hotspots in the Gymshark social community? They're the US Midwest, they're the West Coast, they're Germany in the sort of Cologne, Dusseldorf area, the UK, Melbourne, Australia, the, the places where these first events were that everyone was talking about on social. Right. Stephen, similar for you? I mean, didn't you buy your first, your first website? Was it 50 quid you paid? Or? Yeah, so I was, you know, I had, I raised 5,000 pounds, which to me was just a tremendous amount of money when you're sh literally shoplifting Chicago Town pizzas. And I, I was, so 5,000 pounds, how do you do marketing? You take ads out in the student newspaper. When you've got a student, web, you know, student notice board, you take ads out in the student newspaper, you put flyers up, put posters up. So that's what I went and did. I spent the full 5,000 pounds on doing that and no one came to my website. Even on the posters, when I went out at six in the morning and read, like, I will give you a hundred pounds if you come to, if you sign up to, like, no one signed up to the website. Right. Council come at seven, they rip the posters down, it turns out. So there's your marketing budget gone. And this amazing thing happens to teams when they don't have marketing budgets. They have to innovate. Yep. And we're sat there in uh, MMU because we dropped out and then just, I just hung around the university using the rooms, pretending I was a student. And we're trying to think of other ways to get people to come to the website. And um, I saw this, this Facebook page blowing up, called, and I'm blowing up 5,000 likes, called Things Manchester Students Don't Say. It was a satirical page of things Manchester students would never say. And I thought maybe if I could post my website on there, would, people would come to it. So I, I messaged the guy that owned the page, met him in the town centre, gave him 50 quid. He made me admin. I posted my website on there, and it was the most views we ever got. And I thought, well, I just need to scale that up, similar to what Ben was describing there. Once you figure out what's working, you scale, you scale that thing. And we were obviously with social media, very easy to scale. So 
I just went about in that year meeting every young person I could that had built a social media page, which meant Be Fit Motivation, which was a Twitter page, two million followers following it. The, the same kid that had built the two million follower fitness page owned Love Food on Instagram, which had eight million followers. I met Connor. I said, what are you doing? He said, nothing. I'm living on my mum's sofa. I said, I'm going to give you a proper job. And you get to do that thing you're doing for fun, and you get to, uh, paid more than a doctor does to do it, to make memes. Yeah, so I, and so I went around, and then Hannah was the same. She had 17 million followers. I met Katty, Katty, who's worked with me for seven years now. He had a million followers across his Twitter pages. This was, and uh, Sporf, some of you might know the, the page Sporf mm -hmm. on Twitter. I can see a lot of the yeah, guys nodding. So I met Nick, he was at university at Wolverhampton. He had 400,000 followers on a Twitter page called BBC Sporf which is a parody of, I said, get rid of the BBC bit. We're not gonna, I don't wanna go to war with them. And I'd call it Sporf. Um, we built that to 15 million followers. We built the Facebook page, Student Problems. You know, I met Dominic McGregor, who became my co-founder. He had 11,000 followers when I met him. It now has 13 million. And we, I got these kids as early, you know, and I brought them all in and we built what, you know, the Telegraph wanted them to describe as this meme factory um, at a time when brands thought social media was not a place to be. We were just very early, we had high conviction, and we, you know, we, uh, we went where the numbers said. And there was something really interesting, which was in the question when I read it before I walked on. I was like, how did you know social media was the thing? And it, it almost implies that we have some great intuitive sort of knowledge or wisdom about the future. In fact, I think what it is, is the, f the numbers are clear. The, number in, the numbers in what Ben just said then are really clear, it's working. But what happens is convention tells you that's not the way it's done, and people listen. For me, the numbers were bigger. And, and you know, many people choose to ignore the numbers because convention will tell them that's not the way things are done. And the few that just listen to the first principles are those that seem to go to be successful. Okay. Um, what would you say, fast forwarding to today, what, what are the kind of opportunities that social offers for entrepreneurs who are attempting to grow their business now? How, how can people utilize social media now? What are the opportunities? Well, the opportunities are endless. I think at the time for us, when we were starting out, it was this sort of new space, whereas now it certainly isn't a new space. I think everyone's there and everyone realizes the opportunity. Um, I think there's opportunities in terms of being more of an early adopter onto emerging channels like TikTok and things like that. I think one of the things that we've done well is sort of try to be where people were going rather than where people are, if that makes sense. And I think that's been something that's been really important to us. Right. Stephen, the same, any tips? Um, yeah, I think, again, it's, the, it's kind of what I was just saying there about the, the first principles are actually already speaking to you across your industries. The, the numbers are bigger somewhere. That there's the behavior trends, you don't have to like, front run them. You just have to see them when they're changing. And obviously, the, the NFT, the blockchain, the Web3 space is one of those spaces which is happening right in front of your eyes. But I think 95%, 99% percent of businesses in this room are probably choosing to ignore that. And as soon as you like, lay your, your towel down in the sand, you're, give, you're increasing your probability of success. In social in particular, I would say we've seen this huge shift from public social, which is like sharing stuff on your Facebook page with, we used to once upon a time, literally, you'd message your friend on their Facebook page saying, are you coming out tonight? <laughs> and they would go back onto your Facebook page and say like, no, I'm staying in, my mum's being, you know. And now it all happens in what we call dark social. And this, there's been this resurgence of community, which is Telegram, Reddit, Discord, and, and even WhatsApp groups. This is, this is social media, this is the future of it and how it's splintered off. So if I'm a brand, I'm thinking, how can I cultivate and play a role in these new like dark social communities? And, uh, and that's what I'm thinking a lot about. Right, and, and is there something that, do you, when people obviously find out who you are, and obviously the people will make a beeline for you straight afterwards to, to cut that out, is there one piece of advice you would give to entrepreneurs in order to develop their businesses? Is there a tip you'd give? Ben? From my, so from my experience, which is quite counterintuitive to what we're talking about, I wasn't on social media for the first five or six years of the business. And that was because I was completely consumed by the business and I didn't want any ounce of my attention going anywhere that wasn't the business. Um, so personally, I actually stayed away from it until only in the last few years. Right. Um, yeah, and I think this is part of the reason why I teamed up with Vodafone, which is... Um, and start, start, have started working with their, their V-Hub to support small businesses across the UK. I think that the key thing, especially in a changing landscape, one that we've seen because of that's been sort of incredibly exacerbated by COVID, 
the most important thing for businesses, and it's also something I've seen from afar with Gymshark, is um, staying informed about the moving landscape and trends. Um, and Gymshark are always at the front of trends. They always seem, it's like their team are set up with a philosophy for change. And we are now playing in a landscape, this digital world and this new metaverse world that's coming, which is going to change every single day. One thing we did well at Social Chain is when our staff woke up in the morning, they'd get a text about everything that's changed in the last 24 hours. We called it the ever-changing landscape. And a lot of businesses are resistant to change, but regardless of what, what industry you work in, there is a bulldozer coming behind you called innovation, and it doesn't care how much you love your job or how hard you've worked, and it's going to run you over. That bulldozer, bulldozer is now increasing in speed in the digital world, the, app, the top apps update 10 times a week, cumulatively. So creating a philosophy and a, a culture within your business for change, embracing it, enjoying it, seeing it as an opportunity, I think is the, a winning formula for all businesses. Okay. Uh, I did have a load of other questions, but uh, Jonathan Heath, thank you for yeah. not, me, me not needing them. Um, you've both been monumentally successful in your careers, as we've established, um, but you've also both been hugely positive in terms of moving forward. Do you have long-term ambitions, obviously for business-wise, but beyond business for you personally? Stephen, yours, I'll start with you just for a change, just because you know, your, your, mm. your page on Instagram, for example, is hugely positive and hugely encouraging, and it's, you know, it's kind of debunking a lot of the myths in terms of, you know, if you think all this is about is making money and getting a new car and all of that, it's not. There's more to life. Um, so what, what? So I think at the end there, you kind of answered my question, which was there's more to life. And um, I, I really respect and admire Ben in particular. And we spoke many years ago because he has a wonderful partner. He has a lot more, but he's just got married. Congratulations. Thank you. Ben. <laughs> um, and, uh, and there's more to life than business. So I want to make sure that my life is properly balanced and that I'm investing just as much in my relationships and my health. Um, as I am in my business, so that my life is sustainable from, from all perspectives, not just you know, trying to pursue one goal. So my health, I've started working out a lot. <clears throat> I've just been, my girlfriend lives in Indonesia now, so I've just been there in six weeks, for six weeks, landed yesterday, just trying to get more balance in my life so that it's sustainable. Good. Um, yeah, so I think outside of, I guess outside of my sort of day-to-day -day role at Gymshark, I sort of split my time into two areas. So I, I guess the reason that I do show, social now is I want to provide for young kids what I never had. Like, as a kid, I would go to the gym every single day, and sometimes I didn't know, need to go to the gym, but it's a place where I could find people that I could just, I would always say, I would just peck their head every single day. I'd find someone that was good at something, <laughs> and I would just ask them questions, and I think they'd sort of get a bit pissed off with me because they sort of started leaving the gym. But I learned so much, so I want to provide young kids the view. And by the way, no one's really vlogging what it's like to be a 20-something-year-old chief exec of a unicorn. So it's so cool to be able to give young kids a, an insight into that. Um, and then also I like to do a lot locally in the Midlands, so I'm patron of Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital, so I, I've, my mum's worked in the NHS um, my entire life, um, so I like to support locally the sort of local hospitals in Birmingham because, you know, a lot of the reason that Gymshark exists is because of the work that my mum did as a nurse as well. well that's great, guys. Um, and presumably in your, in your own time you do occasionally, like, hit puppies and things just to leave, yeah. just as a not to even completely out. perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Francis, Stephen Barton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.